podcast. Hey guys, it's Ashley. It's Lauren. Putting my headphones in. Hello, this is Naz Pros. Okay, so um, I know it's been a while since we had Jade come on to talk about her pregnancy and her delivery, and that was kind of one of our labor podcasts, right? Or it was kind of one of our, our pregnancy podcasts. Yeah. And, and then, then we, we had did. Becca Martinez talk about her experience too, but we've never... And we've had a gyno on before. Yeah, just but that was talking about gynecological stuff. health. Yeah. But like this podcast has been going on for like over three years now, and I did want to just do a podcast specifically on labor and postpartum, which would be... Well, the the fourth trimester, which is the three months after you deliver, which people say that is just as hormonally wacky, if not more, than mm. the the nine months That's that you have a baby growing in you. I didn't know it was called the fourth trimester. Oh yeah, I am just loaded with <laughs> you. You know so much. Are you sure you're not pregnant? No, I. You just, know so much about. I, is this? Does this subject just fascinate you? Well, it's fascinating me more and more as I get older and like have to like think about it. Start thinking about it because when you're younger, reality. it seems like such a far distance thing that will never happen to you. But you're like, it's gonna happen in the next what three years. So well, right, yeah, and Jade or any is, day now. Jade is so um, educating. Like even just what she posts on her Instagram yeah, and right. stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I learn a lot through that. Yeah. But and I Becca learned, too. I feel like I learned so much. Oh we yeah, so much I told Becca to Martinez her. when I when she was at Almost Famous a couple weeks ago. I was like, I learned so much about like the world because of you mm-hmm. <laughs> on yeah. your Instagram. She's um, woke as fuck. <laughs> she, she really is, but like she's very educational. Um, so I think that the the, the I think the scariest part. There's two scary, scary parts when it comes to having babies. One is the delivery. And two, it is just, you know, adjusting your lifestyle. I'm not sure which one's scarier. I think, well, there's, I think there's 10 times more, but I, yeah, I think you nailed the top two, but I think your body changing mentally is like all the changes, hormones, the weight, the like hormones and how it affects your mind. It, not getting sleep. Like I feel like to mm-hmm. me, that would be the hardest thing. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Like if I'm not getting sleep, if I'm craving word stuff, if I am like heavier, if it's harder to get out of bed, you know, like all that stuff, I feel like I'm not going to yeah, do Yeah, you're probably well. I mean, more I don't tired think than ever gonna, and you're not going to have the like, ability to actually sleep. Like yeah. fatigue. Like all my friends that have been pregnant in the first or second trimester, they're like, I feel the so fatigued. One, especially. You can't sleep. Apparently, my friend Destiny, who we all have talked about on the podcast before, yeah. came in with her baby yesterday, which is Aww, so crazy. I was oh in my goggles. I was my goggles. And she was like, if you like sleeping, don't do this. Damn. And I was like, oh, okay. And then she was like, also, while you are pregnant, you can't sleep either. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, but you guys are talking about pregnant, like the pregnancy. <clears throat> I know, I know. Nine months. I want to focus today on yes. just labor because that is so scary, and it's something that I've always been like, "What I the don't fuck think is I it? can? I don't think that I can do that. Like, I think I could do everything else, but I really right. don't know if I can do that because I'm the kind of person who faints during a biopsy. Last week, I had uh, a breast biopsy. Don't get scared, guys. I wasn't scared whatsoever. Um, I had a breast biopsy when I was 22, and I have really dense breasts, which means that, and we have, you know, a history of breast cancer in the family. So um, our gynecologist is just like super um, careful and wants to be very thorough about it. So anyway, basically what they do is they stick like a hollow needle in your breast, your boob, and um, and I fainted during the process because and it was like the first proper faint I've ever really had, where like the hearing went out in my ears uh, and like I was it so was like sweaty. A real fa- I've never fainted I didn't lose ever. consciousness. I didn't lose consciousness, but all the other symptoms were there. Just wow. like just, just like, like Lauren to today. today. <laughs> Lauren had another procedure today. She talked about some other time. It's definitely not appropriate for today. And um, I, yeah, so I, I like, really like that work that you because I know you've been like spearheading this one, and I feel like this is such a great thing to really dive into deeply for like an hour, mm-hmm. just a process of labor and all the stuff that we don't get about it or we right. don't even know because we haven't had kids yet and every instance is so specific to you it's like for me like leading off that story it's like okay so you're telling me that i fainted having a small needle in my boob, alone squeezing something but then out of how you am i not pounds. gonna faint yeah. during that like what and i'm sure w- Okay, we have Mama Dr. Jones coming on yeah. to talk to us, and she's one of my favorite YouTubers. I watch her videos every single week. She's so cool. If like you want to know about a well-rounded woman, like a boss bitch, yeah. this is her. She has four kids. Nice. She's like so young, so yeah, pretty, no. and has like and is an OBGYN, like so killer. So, anyways, she's probably going to tell us a little bit about like the actual chemical reactions that allow us not, not to, to pass faint. out. Yeah. yeah. Another question that I have, like for the top of my list, is that my mom. <clears throat> 
it comes from this story. My mom was telling me about, you know, how my dad was in medical school to become an anesthesiologist. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, planned on having the epidural and and planned on it being just like not, she wasn't worried at all. Right. She gets to the hospital and they were like, oh, we we can't do the epidural. It's too late. It's too late. (gasps) Oh, because that's such a good question thing that you bring up because I forgot about that. You have to, you have to ask for it for like during a certain time period. Well, no, but the thing was my dad, they like had this like argument on the phone about whether or not like mom, dad says that mom went from like two inches to eight, two two centimeters to 10 centimeters and like three seconds what which prevented them from being able to do the epidural my oh, mom says is that, that she's, is that rare or is that like i don't know, I don't like know. your vagina Again. can open up that quickly that fast well what happened with jade is that she wasn't even diet like she was two centimeters or something like something so small and then right. all of a sudden the baby started coming through the canal and like oh she God, never dilated for those people listening that don't understand dilation is can you explain actually you're it better with words it's that, like the, na- the natural um like expanding and like the expansion of the of your you know vagina yeah right. the cervix there you go so the cervix is opening yeah the cervix opening so the oh how big the hole is but so the, the thing that scares me is that like even if you are supposedly like calm and like me my mom with lauren mm-hmm. she had an epidural she was at a fantastic hospital for lauren like the best place you want to be to deliver and she was like, that one was like a dental cleaning. It was nothing. Wow. So she like always makes that. She's like, you're going to be fine. It'll be like nothing. And like Lindsay, our right. friend Lindsay, yeah. it was nothing. nothing. So you plan on like people giving you these stories of like, oh, as long as you have the epidural, you're going to be fine. Right. But the thing is, there are so many times like my mom's first birth with me or Jade's. It's like it. you, can, you can't plan anything. You can't plan anything. Yeah. And then what if me, somebody who can't tolerate a, f- a finger prick, has to deliver <laughs> naturally? Well, we're going to call her because she is on a time crunch yeah. and she's dope and we don't want to miss out on her. So we'll ask, we'll her, all ask her all these questions. I can't yeah. wait to meet her Okay, over the... Let's phone, microphone. Give her a call. Is. Okay, here we go. All right, everyone. We have the marvelous Mama Dr. Jones <laughs> on here right now. Um, I found her videos. I think I was watching like uh, Mama Dr. Jones reacts to the midwife or something. And then I watched every single video <laughs> in a row. And now I watch every single week. So thank you so much for being on here. Yeah. And I wanted so. Hey, Dr. Mama Jones. Um, <laughs> and this is Ashley. Um, I'm, I'm going to be 32 next week. And I got married seven months ago. And we know that I, we're going to have to start trying for that first one within the year. And um, I think I've become more and more fascinated with pregnancy and labor since like this time has been encro- encroaching on me. And <laughs> um, I just want to do this podcast about all the things that we don't get about labor. I love it. And I'm so excited to be here. And it makes me incredibly happy that you guys enjoy the videos oh they're Yay. so awesome well lauren's seen so many i am not as familiar so for those listening like myself i was wondering if you could just tell me sort of how you became dr mama jones and like you know what you're all about and what you do sure so i have been on the internet in some capacity for quite a while but i about two and a half years ago started my instagram that is mama dr jones and was just really connecting with people there Mainly my goal is to fight misinformation on the internet because it just seems so rampant, especially in pregnancy and gynecology. So that's been my goal. And I started my YouTube about 14 months ago and it's really taken off and people seem to enjoy having a little bit more information about their health. Wait, 14 months ago? That's incredible. (laughs) Yeah, that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Naz, how's your Best Fiends championship with yourself going? <laughs> it's so good. I've actually been... So when I meet guys, I'm like, okay, Cupid and the other apps I'm on. <laughs> you um, asked them. To- yes, because I feel like it's like a fun way to bond. It is. It Lauren's is been so doing fun. it with Hunter playing games with him yes, online. It's like so much fun. When you're long distance and stuff and you're just like, oh, they, they did something on the, on the Best Fiends. It's so cute. It's it so fun. really is cute to play games, and I feel like it's a good bonding experience. So if you guys don't know what Best Fiends is, it's basically friends without the R. Um, and if you're looking for a fun way to pass the time while engaging your brain and just enjoying breathtaking visuals and a gripping story, your answer is Best Fiends. It's a casual game anyone can play. It's made for adults, just so you guys know. That's what I love. It's made for adults, and it's made for you to like stimulate your brain, too. So it's not like you're just going through Instagram and Twitter when you're waiting for something. Like You're actually 
really like engaging, mm-hmm. which, you know, you're keeping yourself sharp. Yeah. And I, you guys know, I'm always trying to be conscious of like not being on my phone or at least not being on social media. But because I have a phone addiction, as we all do, I've been playing Best Fiends a lot during the week. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So it, so it's like a it's like a unique puzzle and it's unlike any other puzzle out there. It's a game that has a whole bunch of different levels and events so it never gets old. It's like update it updates every month. So there's something new every month. You're going to find yourself playing at all random times um it's great for traveling because you can play in planes and on the subway anywhere that there's not service you don't need service for it and you collect a whole bunch of cute adorable characters and you use them strategically in different ways for each level Exactly. So guys, engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust us with over 100 million downloads. This five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must play. It's also free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. So that's friends without the R, best fiends. So again, that's friends without the R, best fiends. All right. So do you have any questions? questions? Yeah. Okay. Let's Um, do it. We had our Facebook group give a bunch of questions, and I peppered some in of my own. So let's start with how can I get over my anxiety of child labor? <laughs> and I'm going to expand upon that. And, and this is something that we discussed before we got you on the phone. For me, I think it's so anxiety ridden, be, ridden because um, you really don't know like how your experience is going to go through. Like my mom had one horrible experience and one wonderful experience, and I'm thinking, okay, if which I get one am I going to get? Yeah. Like I should be all fine. But there's so many instances where, you're, where you like get to the hospital and they're like, oh, we can't do the epidural, and then I don't even know the amount of panic that would go through me if I couldn't have one. I think I'd be like, just kill me now. so you know first off it's pretty rare to not be able to get an epidural especially the first baby so that although reasonable anxiety is unlikely to happen i think one of the biggest things is just not you know it's kind of a mystery for a lot of people before they do it and so just informing yourself and getting all the information you can from a importantly from reliable sources because some are very sensationalized, I think that can help. And then just finding a doctor or midwife that you really vibe with and trust is super important also. Okay. All right. All right. (laughs) So most of the time it really does go just fine. Do they ever give you medication before you get your epidural, like something to calm you down like mentally? Or is that not allowed? Sometimes, no, sometimes we use IV pain medicine if people want them. Um, That is typically a medicine like fentanyl. And the the downside of those is that they can kind of make you feel a little bit woozy, like Mm -hmm. you've had a margarita or something. Well, I don't know. For some people, that's not a downside. But (laughs) I was like, wait, okay, so yes to this. (laughs) Sign me up. Can you have Um, a margarita right before giving birth? Oh, I'm just wondering. I don't know. (laughs) Wait, are you allowed? By the time when your water breaks. Oh, wait, you can't drink while pregnant, (laughs) No. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, something we recommend. Now you see like how foreign all these things are to me. Oh, That's man. okay. That's just fun. Wait, I, um, I, but, I sorry, keep going. That was no, you're fine. I was just gonna say you, that medicine wears off pretty quickly. So if someone got it and they didn't like the way it made them feel, it usually wears off within about an hour. So yeah, I feel like I would want to remember kind of everything about my um, delivery. Oh, I don't so give I, a, I don't know I don't if I want that. But uh, <laughs> another, if we're just shooting off random things that come yeah. in our heads and things, a pisiotomy. Yeah. Um, what is that? It, it, oh my god. It's kind of <laughs> sorry. You sorry. Can, can, yeah. You, what are you judging me I, for not I, knowing? No. We're literally making this podcast for people. I know. Like me, I, know right? I know. Sorry. I'm confused. I am. I'm okay. shaming Naz, but I'm sorry. Sorry, my dad isn't in the medical <laughs> field, I and I didn't grow up knowing. Okay, this. so Mama, could you tell us please <laughs> what an episiotomy is? For everyone listening. Sure. So episiotomy is where we make extra room by making a cut on the perineum as the baby's coming out. And that is not something that most people do routinely. So in my practice, it's done only if I have talked to the patient and we feel like it's needed for the to expedite delivery, basically. So if baby's heart rate is low and we need to get baby out quicker, or if mom has been pushing and there's a tight rim of tissue, then that will sometimes be the best option. 
if you have an epidural, that's not painful. Mm-hmm. And that's very if you good don't to have know. an epidural, then most of the time we just, you know, we don't do it unless we have to. And it's always something we should talk about first. Okay, or, wait, well, but so it's it's, it's basically cut between cut from your, your like vagina. Your whole, yeah, your do home. you cut it with scissors? Like, how does that work? We usually do use scissors. Yeah. Uh, so, question, and, and then they stitch you back up. I mean, I guess yeah, yeah, most yeah. people get stitched right back up anyway. Right? Yeah, I mean, typically, if you cut an episiotomy, it's in a situation where someone likely would have had a tear. We have lots of research on this. It used to be routine to cut episiotomies because people thought that that would decrease tearing. But what we've found is that it really doesn't and that sometimes it might make it worse. And so it's generally not recommended as a routine thing, but Got it. it typically would be similar to if you t- had a tear and we fix it, it heals very, very... It's really quite amazing, actually. The first time I yeah. saw a really bad obstetric tear, I was horrified and I thought, oh my gosh, how is this ever going to be okay? And people come back in three weeks and it's incredible. Like it, your body is amazing. And it was made to do this. And almost every time it heals back up just perfectly like it was before. Okay. So I have like a really graphic question. If you are cutting the, um, the area between the vagina hole and your, your butthole, um, how do you poop after that? And like, does your poop get like into the vagina? No. So that would be called a fistula and we do not want that to happen. So what you're describing where it is completely connected would be a fourth degree tear mm. or a really severe tear. Oh, okay. mm. Most of the time we don't cut that much, but it can happen. We fix that. I mean, we're surgeons, we're mm-hmm. trained to fix those things. Right. And most people, even after a really bad fourth degree tear, will still to be just fine with continence. You put the muscles back together and put all the tissue back together. Does everyone tear? No, not everyone. Okay. So some people, yeah. What what is the, exactly. Um, Gosh, that's a hard question to answer. It's not uncommon to have some amount of a tear, but it's not very common to have a really bad tear. But it all, but what you're saying is our bodies are amazing and they heal. And so it's not like, like, does it leave like a massive scar? Like it's... You usually can't even see where it was. Got it. Cool. Cool. Amazing. Okay. Okay. Um, so then here's just another a random question. Oh, wait. Yeah, yeah, wait, wait. Uh, still on the, <laughs> so, sorry, sorry. I, these are like, my notes are a little bit messy. Um, so when you do get an episiotomy, is it just like an external thing kind of, or how far in does the episiotomy get cut? Like how many inches into your vagina? Um, it's not, so cutting just on the outside typically isn't super helpful. So it's a little bit to the inside, usually to the hymenal remnant, which is maybe a couple of centimeters. It's not usually a massive thing. Um, it's, it really is situational. That's a hard question to answer because it kind of depends on everybody's anatomy is a little bit different. And it also depends on what you are trying to do with the episiotomy. But I would say mm, two to three percent of deliveries that I do end up that being something that we need to do. Okay. That's definitely not as much as I thought. I thought it was way more routine, but you're saying that that's like an outdated way of doing it. Yeah. Yes. So the people who trained maybe a generation above me Uh were doing 80, 90 plus (gasps) percent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Um, I was on Sex Explained, which you also did a video of, they kind of said the difference of the rates of benefits versus, versus yeah. the cons of an episiotomy. Pros and cons. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, Go ahead and ask. Can I... I'm just curious about like pooping. Someone wrote in, pooping during labor. How many women do it and do the nurses just wipe it away? How does that all go down? Yeah. So most people do poop at some point during the process of pushing and we actually want that to happen because it means you're pushing good. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, it's usually pretty covert. We just wipe it away and move along. You will never find a labor and delivery nurse, a midwife, or an OBGYN who is at all phased by that. It's just not a big deal. But what about the husbands in the room? Oh, God. Are they like... They Ooh. probably won't even know because you wipe it away so fast, they probably don't even realize it's happening. I don't know. Can you smell Most- it though? Sometimes you can, but most of the time the husbands know better than to say anything. Mm. And also if that happens... <laughs> if they know it's good for them. 
Yeah, exactly. If they want the OB to not get very angry. Right. But most of the time, honestly, when it happens, it's usually pretty close to the time that baby comes out. And it's like everybody's just really excited that you're about to have a baby. So that's okay. true. Um, so then this is also very graphic. Is it like a, a straight up like poop, like a, like a poop? Or is it like a little a little bit of poop and like you kind of wipe it away? Or does it like fall on the ground like a big turd? <laughs> um, it's usually not a lot it's usually a small amount but it depends on the person um <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my gosh. laughs> Oh, and if man. somebody has tried to induce their labor with castor oil, then they will very oh, much regret that if oh, they're trying to sure. it. Wait, what does that mean? Tell me about that. What does that mean? Castor oil is something that people have touted as kind of a inducing yourself at home. And there may be some evidence that it might be helpful, but the problem is that one of the main things that castor oil definitely does when you drink it is cause massive diarrhea. Wow. And so... Oh, well, I know what I'm drinking after this podcast. Oh my God. <laughs> you want it now. <laughs> Wait, I didn't know that you could just drink castor oil. That's no, not really. Right. I don't Thank think you. you normally do you it unless sh- you're trying to get a baby out you of you. You shouldn't, right? Unless you're like under medical. <laughs> it's a <laughs> like, laxative. I would never wow. recommend anybody do that because... Okay. If you don't go into labor, you're going to have terrible diarrhea. And if you do in- go into labor, you're going to be in labor with terrible diarrhea. diarrhea. Oh, okay. good lord. I'm never doing that. All yeah. right. But people- you probably feel so skinny after, right? Well, probably not <laughs> while you're giving birth. People talk about how scary the first couple poops are after you get out of the hospital. Or like the first time you're in the hospital and you're like, oh, I have to go. And then the nurse has to help you out. Please explain. Yeah, everybody's always terrified about that. And then almost universally, everyone says, oh, no, that wasn't as big of a deal as I thought it was going to be. So it's a common anxiety that usually ends up being not a big deal. Nice. Uh, Right after you have a baby, um, I notice whatever in movies and stuff, your belly doesn't immediately go down. Like your whole... Your whole cervix isn't just the baby and it takes a while to like deflate. Mm. Why is that? Well, you know, the baby has grown there for... 40 weeks and everything is just stretched out and it really depends on the person i mean some people it's a quick thing and for some people it takes months and months and that's okay i always encourage people just to give themselves the time to be an individual be nice to yourself your body grew a human and you'll go back usually to what you were before and if not you just we find ways to be happy with how we look after Mm -hmm. our babies come. Um, but it's, you know, your muscles are stretched out. You also retain a lot of fluid in pregnancy. And so all the tissue that's between the skin and the muscles can be a little bit kind of edematous with extra fluid. And it just takes time for everything to go down. But usually within a couple of weeks, you'll start feeling quite a bit better. But I mean, after I had my twins, it was, I was like the Pillsbury Doughboy for a few days. And <sighs> it it is a weird feeling, but yeah, it's you like know, you're out. You, just, you should go. You should go back down. You know. Yeah, but I. Yeah. Why do we? I feel like celebrities make us feel like it should go back down. Like, uh, remember when Kate Middleton came out and she gosh, was she had like true. makeup on? She I was like talked about that on a podcast I'm, and how horrified she was that she had to do that that day. Well, Did yeah. the royal family make her? Well, that's like tradition. That's disgusting. Except for what Meg, to me. Megan said, "Fuck that." Good. Which is also one of the reasons when Megan's pretty I cool. like Megan now. Okay, me too. I, I turned you. around. <laughs> okay, so this, speaking of like going, things going down, this is a quote from one of our listeners. She goes, they push on your damn uterus to get it go down. Oh okay. my God. I had no clue that they would do that. It hurts so freaking bad. I'm like, um, I felt like my nurse was laying on top of me to get the pressure on my uterus. She said, honey, this is really going to be unpleasant, but just hold on to your baby. She legit handed me my son to hold and started applying pressure. I almost came up off the table. That whole afterbirth process was worse than pushing the baby out and nobody warns you about this. What afterbirth process? I thought you literally get to have like in and out after and hold the baby in your oh, hand. Oh, Naz, we're going to further <laughs> surprise you with the next question. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. So, okay, yeah. So the uterus takes time to go back down to its normal size. Typically, right after delivery, it's going to be about the size that it was around 20 weeks. So you still, if you feel like you still look pregnant, it's because the uterus is still 20 week size. It just takes a long time for that muscle to get back down to really tiny. And then what they're describing is called fundal massage. 
And basically, Ooh, oh the Lord. fund is... <laughs> Wait, what massage? Sorry, I missed it. Fun? The f- fundal, F-U-N-D-A-L. The fundus fundal is the top, top of the uterus. And so what they're doing is confirming that it's nice and contracted because you can have some relaxation of that muscle where it's not contracted down and that can lead to bleeding happening on the inside of the uterus. And so they're just making sure that you don't have a lot of bleeding going on. Does that happen with everyone? Do they do that to everyone? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a routine part of postpartum. You know, I've had three babies and after my C-sections, I remember it being uncomfortable, but I don't remember it being as bad as it was described in okay. what you just read. All right. <laughs> but maybe it's different, you know, case by case. Speaking of um, blood, someone asked, how much blood is there and how much blood do you bleed into the diaper you wear for six weeks after? Okay, that's a good question. So you have an increase in your blood volume during pregnancy, specifically because your body needs to supply the placenta and the baby. And then after delivery, you lose some amount of blood and your body kind of gears up for that. So a normal amount of blood loss in a vaginal delivery is about 500 milliliters, which is half a liter. So if you think of like a liter Coke, Half of half that of during that? the delivery. That doesn't that's sound bad. that bad. Yeah. Guys, that's a lot to no, me. No, think about a two liter Coke. But think, about, think about your life. How much blood do you see coming out of your body in your life if you get shots and you don't have any surgeries? And like nothing. for the most part, Usually see nothing. I've never really seen blood come out. So if, if I saw that much for the first time, that would freak me out. Dumping that much on the floor, it does look like a lot. I mean, okay. usually we catch it, but it, it can be jarring to people who have not seen it before. That so. Is, uh, I don't know if I can. But you don't see all of that. (laughs) Most of that you don't see. (laughs) Most of it we keep contained and it's typically not like a traumatic experience. And that's at delivery. So then in the postpartum period, it should be like like the heaviest day of your period, maybe a little bit heavier than that. Wait, is that like... You're saying that's the day after? From, yeah. I mean, and for probably a couple of weeks you'll have really heavy bleeding. Okay. Really? Like every day? Yeah, I was just going to say, how? what about the blood clots that you see in the toilet? People are talking about that. Oh, yes. I remember my best friend telling me about this. Oh, God. Yeah, it depends. It depends on the person. So some people have really heavy bleeding for many days, but it really shouldn't be heavier than a heavy period. And the blood clots thing, the way I usually explain blood clots to people is when you're sitting down or lying down, the vaginal vault is not a direct exit to the outside world. And so blood can sit there and become a blood clot. And when you stand up or move around or sit down to go to the bathroom, that comes out. So if someone has, yeah, if you have blood clots, but you're not having heavy bleeding and blood clots, it can be pretty normal. But if you're like, Bleeding, 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 and a bunch of blood clots, that's definitely not normal. Mm, so, okay. Can those blood clots like cause any other side effects or health issues like after birth? As long as it's not... I mean, if you're bleeding too much, obviously you can become anemic, but that's rare. So if you feel like you're... Ble- and the nurses before you leave postpartum and your doctor too should give you parameters on when to call or come in what's too much blood loss. But for the most part, blood clots in and of themselves in the absence of really heavy bleeding are not themselves concerning. Uh, You know, if you are nervous about childbirth, maybe so, so much so that you feel like you need to talk to a therapist about it, we have a recommendation for you. It's called BetterHelp. You know, we've talked about it on the podcast before. We love it because they are licensed professional counselors who are specialized in a whole ton of stuff, including anxiety, which could be good for that, but depression, stress, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, and self-esteem. And you can do it all from your house. It's online in a safe and private online environment. So it's convenient. You don't have to get stressed about driving to a doctor's office. And what I love about it is that anything you share is confidential. Like Ashley was saying, it is so convenient. I'm so happy that... um that we work with them and they are a sponsor for our podcast because I feel like a lot of you always post in the Facebook group things like, you know, that you need help with or you look, go to the community for advice. And I feel like this is just another place you can go if you're struggling with something really hard. There's over 3,000 US licensed therapists across all 50 states. It's available worldwide. So it doesn't matter where you're listening to our podcast. You can do better help through text, chat, phone, or video. And you can start talking to someone in under 24 hours, which is so, so 
fast. It is so, so fast. But best of all, it's truly an affordable option. I don't get it, listeners. Get 10% off your first month with discount code get it, G-E-T-I-T. So get started today. Go to betterhelp.com slash get it. All you got to do is fill out a questionnaire that's going to help them assist your needs and get matched with a counselor that you're going to love. Betterhelp.com slash get it. Uh, do you recommend eating the placenta afterwards oh, in saving the question. umbilical cord? No, no? absolutely not. You think, wow. it's yeah. okay. you think it's BS? <laughs> Wait, why? Because yeah. I wanted to. Because Courtney Kardashian. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you, <laughs> if so, if someone wants to, that is definitely within their rights. But there's no medical reason to do that. And okay. you know, there's lots of people who say, oh, it decreases postpartum depression and all these things. And there's no real literature that supports that idea. It may have placebo effect, and if someone wants to do that, that's certainly within their rights. But I don't think there's a medical reason. Placentas are also kind of, I mean, they they the purpose is to clean out all of the things that you don't want to get into the baby's bloodstream. So the placenta mm. kind of catches all of that. And it's like a sponge for things that your body didn't want to go all the way through to baby. So, so why would you want to eat that? Why wouldn't you yeah. want to eat it? Okay. They can, and then another problem I have with this industry is the people who do some of that, you don't know for sure what they're putting in those. It's not a regulated industry. You don't know if it's sterile, if they are using their equipment to sterilize somebody's or to dry someone's placenta who had a disgusting infection or who has HIV. I mean, you have no idea what's going on if it's not regulated. So totally up to each individual, but it's not medically important. Got it. And the um, umbilical cord? Mm. Um, you know, I've never had anyone specifically request to keep an umbilical cord. Um, mm. What purpose? Like, I guess yeah, I don't know sure? this thing. Who said that? I never heard Lawrence, about keeping an umbilical cord. She's so creepy. Cord. She probably wants to put in a jar yeah, for decoration. Yeah, maybe some people put in, in jars. Disgusting. I don't know. Disgusting. Okay. Moving on, Ness. Okay, so I have a question. <laughs> and this, is may, again, may be a very naive question. Recently, I was watching Goop Lab. I can't stop talking about it, but... There's an episode about orgasms and how, you know, orgasms portrayed in movies aren't real orgasms. So as for someone who's never seen someone actually give birth to what we see in movies, my question is centered around pushing. Is it really like the, ah, 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 or is that something we see in movies and it's actually more calmer or is it crazier? And then I have a follow up. It depends, I think, on the person's, so there's like three separate types of birth. There's a person who like would like to have an epidural and doesn't have one. And that sometimes can look like it looks in a movie. Mm -hmm. And then there's a person who came in not wanting an epidural and is prepared for that and has done, you know, their personal type of pain control, hypnobirthing or has a doula helping them or whatever. And most of the time it does not look like that for that person. Mm -hmm. And then there's people with an epidural, which usually is not screaming in chaos. So... Yeah. It, it depends on the person, but it's usually not like that. Got it. And then the follow-up to that is a question someone sent in, and they said, I don't get why people don't talk more about using different positions other than just delivering on your back or in water. Very good. Because you can't... Yeah, so, uh, oh, wait. Um, I Sorry. I just learned the no, answer to this. Yeah. And that's because if you do do on your back, like you sit on your knees like, like Jade did, yeah. it's because you can't have an epidural and, and do that. Oh. So you only can get an epidural if you're lying on your back. Dr. Emma Jones? Well, yeah. So it's, you can, the epidural just makes you really kind of numb in your lower extremities. So you can't, it's hard to move around safely when you have an epidural. So that mm. most women in the U.S. choose to give birth with an epidural and you do push on your back with an epidural. If someone doesn't have an epidural, they can push however they want. I think it is varied. Some people want to do it squatting. Some people want to be lying down and some people want to be on all fours. It really just depends on the person. And I think people should birth in whatever position they feel most comfortable in. And for people who have an epidural, that's, they feel most comfortable with an epidural, then they are going to push on their back because that's what's safest for them. Okay. So nobody talks about giving birth to the placenta after you give birth to the baby and you have to like push again once it's already out. And like, I just don't understand how this is something that like I didn't learn until my upper twenties and <laughs> like the, the placenta is like pretty big. It's like another b- mini baby coming out. I didn't know that till this second. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> you have to push something else out after yeah. you push a kid out. Yeah. Jesus Christ. 
It's usually a, a very low impact part of the delivery. So it, people maybe push a little bit one time. The placenta separates and it it is sometimes kind of big, but it's squishy and compressible. Whereas it's like, like a baby shoulders. Is, Have you ever seen it? Exactly. It's disgusting. <laughs> oh, I have sorry. not seen it. No, they're all beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> She's talking about placentas. <laughs> um, they don't, someone wrote in, they don't tell you the more babies you have, the more painful your contractions are after giving birth, particularly while nursing, like as bad as giving birth contractions. Hmm, never heard of that either. I, I do have a lot of people tell me that their postpartum cramps are way worse with each delivery that I would say is less similar. I mean, it is like contractions, but it's not, it's kind of between menstrual cramps and contractions, like somewhere in between there, like a bad period cramp. Mm. I'm going to show them a picture of a placenta right now. Okay. Is it, is it okay. Kourtney Kardashian's? They it look like looks exactly steaks. what I would imagine. Yeah, it looks like a really? giant. It doesn't yeah. look that gross. Oh, I thought it would be like a little. It looks like a, a huge thing. blood clot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It looks like a big. Piece I of think steak. placentas are very amazing. Yeah. I, what is really? what does the placenta do? <laughs> yeah, so the placenta takes over for supplying oxygen and nutrition and blood to the baby from about nine weeks on. That's and incredible. I do want to eat it, really it I is. think. That sounds like a really smart organ I should eat and have it me again. <laughs> like octopus. This is our modern woman right here. Uh, I'll support you in whatever makes you happy. This is a woman that's going to have a child at 40 and I'll re-listen to this podcast and be so thankful I recorded it 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, it And then it it supplies the blood. And actually babies, I don't know if y'all know this, but babies have different, like their blood flows in a different way than it does when you come out. And so that first breath that a baby takes, it closes off some of the separating ways that the blood flows so that they can convert to normal blood flow because with the placenta, it has to kind of go in a different direction in some of the places. So, so weird. That's, That's super fascinating. interesting. That's fascinating. Um, okay, so you, you start going into labor, your water breaks, you start having contractions. They're pretty far apart at that point. At what point um do you have to be dilated enough to get an epidural and then after you get the epidural do you stop feeling those contractions and they feel like more like pressure than pain and yeah that's a great question how long does it take to set in <laughs> yeah so epidural works pretty quickly once you get it in most people but it's it's not an exact science so sometimes it takes a little time and sometimes they don't work 100 percent. but most people feel at least better with it um as far as when you can get it my personal opinion on epidurals is that if somebody desires an epidural, they should be given an epidural as soon as they want it. There uh-huh. shouldn't be a cutoff for that. But, you know, I'm not the anesthesiologist and that's going to vary a little bit by location. But do you have to be a certain amount of centimeters dilated in order to get it? I don't have that as a requirement in my hospital. And then does it, like, it's, people obviously, like, they want to feel like, oh, I want to feel everything, which is a reason they don't get it. But also, is there truth to the fact that epidurals might slow the process down a little bit? Mm, that's a good question. Not that that, like, I mean, I don't care how long it is as long as it's less painful. Yeah, so yeah, there but is some a people are in labor for, like, 48 hours, right? Even longer. Um, yeah, it depends on what you call the start of labor, but there definitely are people who have contractions for that amount of time as far as slowing it down though it's about 30 minutes um different 30 minutes difference (laughs) that's nothing why would i don't understand i get i get why people would want actually you can answer this question for me because my mom had a natural birth with me and she said that she loved that she had a natural birth because right after i came out she was able to eat right away and so i don't know if this is a thing from back in the day or my mom was just lying to me <laughs> but is that a thing now today it's, a, it's a, i want to say something it's a natural birth if you have an epidural as well so like this phrase natural birth is like shaming people who have epidurals yeah that's true but i think people yeah. that want to not get one too that's fine right yeah, of course. Yeah, it's yeah just so absolutely. Painful. I mean, people should labor however they want. And I have plenty of people who loved their vaginal delivery without an epidural and plenty of people who loved their epidural. I would always choose an epidural, but I'm also, I would, it's just me. And people should be supported in whatever they choose. Um, you can eat right after delivery regardless, though. Great. Yeah, I don't know I'm, if I'd really, that's the first thing that would be on my mind is to put something in my mouth, though. 
Oh, yeah. yeah, probably not. Probably not. No. So did you have epidurals with all of your babies? Well, she had a C-section with the twins. Yeah, I had a C-section with my twins because twin A was breech. And then I tried to V-back with my first son and I abrupted in labor, which is where the placenta separates from the side of the uterus and had a pants on fire C-section emergency uh-huh. in like eight eight minutes from the time that we left my labor room into his birth time Whoa. and by C-section. That's so fast. Yeah, it was very scary. Wow, that's so fast. Yeah, so guys I chose take to so have much longer to text time. me back than <laughs> you had. A, so now when a guy doesn't text me back, I'm gonna be like, I could have had a baby in this amount of time. I love that you. What you taught me, the number one thing from Mom and Doctor Jones is that it's not breached, it's breach. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, I wanted to ask you about someone. Someone wrote in and wrote, "What's back labor? Is that did we already sort of cover?" My that? mom had back so. labor with me. What does mm-hmm. that mean? Back labor is what people describe when they are feeling their contractions more like in their back than in their abdomen. Um, and generally, we associate that with babies who are what we call OP, occiput posterior, or like sunny side up, stargazing, basically facing the ceiling as they come down the birth canal instead of facing the floor. Mm. Uh, and you just feel the pain more in your back. It's kind of pressure on the spine a little bit more. I wonder what, but I isn't would rather- it more painful? People do describe it as being really intense pain in some situations. Okay, this is a, a fear of mine that I've had for a very long time because of the movie Jersey Girl with Ben Affleck and Jayla. She dies in the beginning of the movie giving birth because she has an aneurysm from pushing too hard. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's it so scary. incredibly rare. Um, but don't 800 women still die a day from in, childbirth? In America. So, so help me. <laughs> okay. So the, the 700 women die per year in the U.S. from oh, like just things don't. associated with childbirth. So although I don't want to minimize this, there is a lot of people. And if that is someone that I take care of or I know or it's... Like that's every single one of those people matter, but the risk is extremely low compared to like your absolute risk of that happening to you. So I have a video about maternal mortality that goes over a little bit of that. And Mm. that goes over the race disparities in the U.S. and compares some of our rates to other places. But the risk of dying in childbirth overall is very low now again we need to work on it and make it better because it's higher here than it should be and higher here than in other developed countries but it's just not very common and most of us as obstetricians will go through our entire career without ever seeing that happen what what would be the reasons why would it be a pushing too hard like what would be reasons why someone would honestly it's not very common to happen like right at the time of delivery. A lot of those deaths are in the days and weeks after or maybe around the time of delivery for things like hemorrhage or amniotic fluid embolism. But again, these are really, really rare situations. Um, Since you've been telling us a lot about the United States, I'm just curious, internationally, um, is there... I don't know what I want to ask. I want to ask, like, it how is, is our how is our procedure of like childbirth in the United States different and better or worse than how they deliver babies around the world? Reading a new report, it says that our our rates should definitely be better than they are right now, comparably to international numbers. Absolutely, a hundred percent. That is accurate, and the problem with it is multifactorial. I mean, this is such a nuanced discussion that I know we don't want to get into all of it here, but part of it is access to healthcare and access to healthcare that is not based on your socioeconomic status because other countries have everybody with access to safe and affordable care. Um, The other part that I think other countries do really well is a system that really integrates midwife care into the obstetric hospital care. And we don't do that as well in the U.S. And midwifery care in the 
U.S. is not very regulated. So there's a lot of different types of midwives, but they all get to call themselves midwife. Got so it. you can have a midwife that only has a post high school certificate and has been to 20 births. Okay. Or you can have what I would consider a really great midwife, a certified nurse midwife or a certified midwife. And that's a graduate level professional degree, but they all call themselves midwife and it's very confusing. But when you say that other countries or people around the world have a better process when it comes to midwives than we do, what does that mean exactly? So in other countries, the definition of midwife is very clear. It's the same training for anyone who's allowed to call themselves a midwife. So you won't ever have someone like in Sweden where the birth process is extremely safe comparatively to here. If they say they're a midwife, you know exactly what training they have. And then they also have a system where they're well integrated into the hospital system. And that means they don't have an incentive if you're delivering outside the hospital to keep you there longer than it's safe because they can go with you to the hospital. True. That's very interesting. Okay. But what do they do like in other places than they would here, I guess is my question. Um, Yeah. I think part of this, again, is the access to care issues. So people don't have care as early and they potentially enter into pregnancy less healthy than in other places. Um, And part of it, you know, we've seen California reduce their maternal mortality rate significantly by adopting very distinct ways to manage major complications and kind of make that a protocol so that everybody's following excellent standards. Another really important thing is the postpartum follow-up because a lot of these deaths are happening outside of the hospital after people go home from all manner of things, but there's mental health issues. Suicide Mm -hmm. is a big player in this. Mm. And there are violence issues. And then there are just normal like things that people get that if we catch early, we can treat like infections and hemorrhage. And in other countries, you have a midwife or a a attendant who comes to your house and sees you frequently after birth. And we don't have a setup for that in the U.S. That'd be very nice to have. Yeah. Okay, turning a corner here, what's a mucus plug? (laughs) Okay, so mucus plug is literally the cervix as baby grows. It needs to create a barrier between the baby's house and the outside world. And that's done just by increasing cervical mucus. So there's more cervical mucus and it's thicker. And as you get closer to delivery and the cervix starts to open a little bit, Sometimes people notice that that comes out as a big glob of mucus. Mm, okay. Mm. okay. And sometimes it just comes out over time. I've had three pregnancies. I've never actually seen a mucus plug of my own. So it's not that everybody experiences it the same. So that mucus um, layer, I guess, will keep the baby from feeling like a, a penis, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the cervix does the ma- majority of that. The it's cervix? more like a bacterial barrier, yeah. It's oh, okay. a pillow. Okay. Is it a mucus pillow? <laughs> we call it a mucus pillow. <laughs> um, I would love to ask you about breastfeeding. How bad yes. does breastfeeding hurt? Okay, so and about And if you could go into latching a little bit as well, because I know that that's a whole thing I'd love to know more about. Yeah, so the thing with breastfeeding is that You can be really, really sore when you first start breastfeeding, but the biggest part is making sure that you are getting a good latch. And if you aren't doing that, is not letting the baby continue to have a bad latch because that continues to propagate this essentially friction that causes pain and blisters and difficulty healing. So the most common thing, I mean, my breastfeeding discussions are always more from personal experience because we don't get a lot of formal training in breastfeeding. But in my personal experience, no one tells us shit. No one tells us shit. This is crazy. (laughs) Yes. That's why there's podcasts like this. In my head, I'm like, how do you even know if you have a good latch? Is that just a natural thing where you're just, you're, you just feel it, you know, I'm assuming that's what happened. You definitely can tell when you're nursing, but also like at our hospital, we have lactation consultants that see every patient after delivery. And I would strongly advise being in contact with a lactation consultant. Um, But you don't want to let the baby just continue to have a bad latch. So me personally, in the middle of the night when I was frustrated with breastfeeding and I would finally get baby latched on and I would know it was a bad latch because it was uncomfortable, I'm always tempted to go like, oh, 
but we're finally not screaming and we're lashed, just uh-huh. let the baby nurse. And that's how you end up getting into that really painful situation. So all breastfeeding has kind of an adjustment time where you're going to be hurting, but it's usually manageable unless there's something going on that has to do with the latch being bad or an infection or something like that. Okay, so this may be kind of a silly question, but um, (laughs) I'm like laughing, like asking it. When your breasts produce milk, like, does the baby create a hole? Is there a hole already built in? Where does the milk come out of? I seriously have no idea. Oh my gosh. Okay, so yeah, it's already there and it's not just one. So you should look up videos of people expressing breast milk. It's really kind of wild if you've wow. never seen it. Oh, it's, is there a good Instagram like account a, for that? Probably not. <sighs> Yeah, Instagram would probably take it down. I don't know it off the top of my head, but I bet there exists one. But it's like, ah, what can I explain it? Like if you put a whole bunch of little holes into a like a sprinkler or something, like it's several places that the milk comes out. But it's already there. Like it's there in my boob right now. Like there's a little hole and I just don't know it's there. Yeah, they're like pores. Wow. That's cool. I always thought the baby like bit a little hole. <laughs> No, no. So stupid. Uh, no, that's not stupid. I mean, breastfeeding is such, I always encourage my patients, like, if you don't want to take a birth class and you just want to leave everything up to the nurses and the doctors and that's what you'd prefer to do, that's fine. But if you're going to breastfeed, take a breastfeeding class, make your significant other get involved with that because it requires a whole bunch of support. I right. really attribute my success with breastfeeding to how supportive my husband was in the whole process because Good. it's so necessary to have Good. someone supportive with you. Do you, just on breastfeeding, do you take a side on like, breastfeeding over formula? Like what is your stance on that? I know it's a very controversial sort of topic. Yeah. I, you know, breastfeeding is always optimal as far as nutrition goes. But that being said, I don't think that there's any situation where in the United States where formula is incredibly safe, that somebody should be so stressed or so upset or so overwhelmed with breastfeeding that it interferes with their ability to enjoy their baby. Mm. So I tell my moms, like, if you want to breastfeed, do everything you can. I'll support you every step of the way. But if it becomes so problematic that you can't enjoy this time and you feel like you want to give up, it's okay. And giving up is such, I shouldn't have even said it like that. If you feel like you want to switch to formula, right? that's okay. Just be kind to yourself. Give yourself the grace to change the plan and be okay with it. I love your answer on that. I think that's incredible because I feel like a lot of women get stressed. They feel like they have to breastfeed mentally. They think that that's the right thing to do. That's the natural order of things. And I think it can be extremely taxing on like, especially a first time mom to like adjust to life right after they have a kid on top of worrying about producing bottles all or sorry, milk all the time. Yeah. Bottles, bottles on bottles. (laughs) All right. We got two very hard. We got two more questions for you. If, um, if you're okay with that. Yes, for sure. Okay, great. So somebody said, I had no idea that your bladder sometimes doesn't wake up after birth and it takes hours and days. What the heck does that mean? Um, yeah, so this is um, a little bit hard to answer just as a one answer question, but an epidural can make it slow for your bladder to wake up and you can have urinary retention. That's pretty unusual just from an epidural Spinal with a C-section, that maybe is a little more common for someone to have a longer time and maybe need to have their catheter put back in. I would say one in 50 or one in maybe even less than that. It's not very common. And then the process of pushing sometimes can make your nerves in your bladder and the nerves that supply the bladder stretched out. And then it takes time for that all to go back to normal where you have that sensation that you need to urinate. Okay. So then like you like have to go, but you wouldn't even know. So you have a catheter yeah. in, so you're fine. Well, yeah. I mean, most people who have a vaginal delivery won't have a catheter in afterwards. And most of them won't have trouble with going to the bathroom afterwards. Right. So the nurses keep an eye on that. And they are monitoring to make sure that you're not retaining urine and not knowing that it's happening. Okay. How long do you stay in the hospital after you give birth usually? Oh if God, it's just I was a vaginal just thinking one. that. Yeah, it varies by 
location, I found, because I thought it was very normal for people just to stay one or two nights with a vaginal delivery and two nights with a Mm C-section. But as I took my oral board exam last year, some of the people reviewing my case list were horrified that my (sighs) patients were going home one or two days after delivery. Uh And they were keeping their patients a long time, which I don't think keeping people in the hospital longer than they need to be there makes sense. It's you're at risk for hospital acquired infections. You, your baby could get sick, like go home where there's not so many germs, uh, unless I'm doing something for you in the hospital that you can't do at home. So it varies, but one to three nights, I would say. Okay. Now is there anything else? I yeah, this on. one, it's not necessarily in the giving birth vein, but I just have a question. Um, I know some people that like sleep with their newborn and then some people are like, that's not good. And I just wanted to hear from like a doctor what your thoughts are on that. I'm not a pediatrician, but the American Academy of Pediatrics definitely recommends that babies be on their own sleep surface on their back with no blankets or pillows or anything like that around them to decrease the risk of SIDS or suffocation. And there's a lot of controversy that goes along with that. But being as I'm not a pediatrician, I, I just have to go along with what the pediatricians recommend. Got it. I know that I'm, I'm cheated. It's not exactly been two questions, but this is the last one I have written down. Um, this is something that nobody tells you, our listener says, when you have your second child and beyond, when you nurse, you have intense u- uterine contractions. Yeah, that's actually a really... so. This is because that's your body's natural way of keeping you from bleeding too much. So back before we had any medicines that we had to help with that, the way that you treated a postpartum hemorrhage was by getting the baby to latch and nurse because the process of that creates oxytocin, which causes the uterus to contract down and decreases bleeding. Mm. So that's your body's natural way of decreasing bleeding. But for whatever reason, it does seem to be a little bit more intense with each subsequent delivery. Very interesting. Very interesting. Is there anything that we didn't ask that you feel like women should know that is not often talked about before getting pregnant and, you know, preparing for delivery? I think the biggest thing, just to circle back to the beginning questions with regards to just being anxious or scared, is that for the most part, birth is not something that I think people should be scared of. It It is an unknown and that makes it seem scary. But as long as you have people around who are there to help you and who are on your side and kind of teaching you the ins and outs, every you'll do fine. And the other big thing is just give yourself, like we were saying with breastfeeding, just give yourself permission to be okay with changing the plan. For people who make a birth plan, you know, it's okay to plan as much or as little as you would like, but don't it's like planning a wedding. Don't try to plan the weather because if you try to plan the weather and then it rains, you'll be disappointed. That's such a good quote. This oh, was so okay. informative. Okay, but then like, what are the odds that like <laughs> I don't get to get an epidural? Like, how many she women go? You're gonna survive. Not you're gonna survive though if you can't, and no. it'll but still be amazing. That's the thing with a first baby. It's very, very, very unusual for someone to wait to come to the hospital until they're so close to delivery that you can't give it because. Okay. Most people with a first baby are even going to push for an hour or two. So even if you were like ready to push, a lot of times you could still get an epidural. Um, But if you're so close to delivery that you can't get an epidural, it's going to be over really quickly. And that's the only reason that it would be not able to happen unless there was something medical going on that prevented it. Okay. You're the best. Where can people find you on YouTube, on Instagram, email you if they have questions? What ho- Are you allowed to say what hospital you work at if people are interested in giving birth there? Sure. So I'm in College Station, Texas, and they can. Uh, there's only one hospital in College Station, and they'd be able to find me. And I am on every social media outlet for better or for worse as Mama Dr. Jones. And so you can find me there, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. <laughs> Oh my God, you're on TikTok? Are you like, what are yes. you putting up on TikTok? I gotta, I gotta, you should go check it out. Okay, it's so well. fun. Yeah, it's like sex ed mainly because the kids that's are awesome. younger there. Wait, yes. that's incredible. That's really the cool. world needs you. Yeah, you're awesome. Thanks that's for amazing. what you do. And, oh, thank you guys so much. I enjoyed chatting with you. Oh, thank you. So informative. Like, now I don't even have a question left, I don't think, <laughs> until I get to the doctors as a pregnant woman, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. All right. Thank you. Bye. 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 I don't get it. Podcast.